Hello, it's lovely to see you all here. I'm Susan Whitfield. Um, I'm a member of council of the RAS. I'm chairing tonight. Thank you for turning up and thank you to the team participants you know, who are also watching us from various parts of the world, I hope. I'm delighted to have to be able to chair introduce this talk this evening because I work on the Silk Road and I think Armenia is at the heart of the Silk Road, but it so often only gets a bit part in the story of the Silk Road or even isn't mentioned at all. So the work that Dr. Franklin has been doing, looking at how the Silk Road is represented, especially through the everydayness, um, everyday and everyday life of the archaeology of Romania is very close to my heart and I'm delighted um, to be able to, as um, I said, to be able to introduce this talk this evening. So without further ado, um, we're delighted to have Dr. Kate Franklin from Birkbeck College, um, University of London, living the Silk Road every day. Thank you so much. Um, and it is an absolute delight to be here physically with all of you and um, with all of you um, out watching remotely. And I'm look really looking forward to the conversation after this talk, which I'm going to keep relatively informal. I mostly just want to share um, some stories with you all um, about my archeological research in the Republic of Armenia um, and the kind of the reflections that I've had over the last few years um, on thinking about the Silk Road. Um, and in particular, in the course of writing uh, Wait a second. What do I point out to, to uh, go forward? I'm so sorry. I was... Well, this is, I think we need to, oh, that's not working. Oh, I bet I need to. Um... Yes, okay. thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh... <laughs> Sorry, um, the work, the stories I've been thinking about reflecting on and the materiality that I've been working with in the process of um, the long work that has resulted in uh, this book, which is just out with the University of California Press, um, and which Susan was um, delightful and so kind to, uh, kind enough to, um, to both review and write jacket copy for. So if you want to read her jacket copy, um, <laughs> um, pick up a book, but it's also available, um, free to read open, open access from, um, UC Press online, um, which is why I didn't bring any to, like, wave over my head as I'm talking. Um, so this, Book tells tells my story of kind of thinking about the Silk Road, which is an an overwhelming and romantic and all encompassing concept. You know, uh, it's it's a lifer of a of an idea um, from through the perspective of material culture and from my perspective um, as an anthropologist and an archaeologist, but also as a lover of stories and someone who for a long time has I've been really. Um, interested and um, and kind of obsessed, really, with the way that places are known through the stories that are told about them. Um, and that, um, and I have this long-term interdisciplinary interest in the layering of imagined and physical landscapes, which my students at Birkbeck can tell you. Um, I am constantly clashing literary and textual and physical and um, historical evidence on place and on the making of place, and especially on places that are also times that are also stories such as the Silk Road and then the little places that get caught up in, caught up in those narratives such as Armenia and the Armenians in the Middle Ages in particular. The period that I work on is um, between the third, like in the, as I will explore the long Mongol century. And so a central questions to my work still ongoing in Armenia and into this book, which um, is based on excavations that I did more than 10 years ago. Um, look at this juxtaposition between the idea of everyday life, the realm of everyday life, and large global, like larger than life culture, such as that which we refer to as the Silk Road. These networks of travel, encounter, exchange, mutual influence, mutual desire, um, and interchange that really encompassed all of the world in um, the ancient and medieval periods. And so for me, I've long been struck by this apparent oxymoron, this apparent mutual exclusivity of the idea of the Silk Road as something that is all about adventure and encounter and romance and the realms of everyday life, which 
for archaeologists is is the meat, the meat and the heart of what we do. We look at the more or less humble remains most of the time of people's everyday lives and their habits and their maintenance activities and the kind of um, the everyday cycles and very, very different time and temporal and spatial scales and we associate with grand trans transcontinental journeys of people and things. Um, and so the kind of question that's been driving a lot of my research is how, and that I'm going to talk about tonight, is like thinking about how we as archaeologists and, and historians reconcile the scales of our evidence, the things that we work with, and the stories that we are writing through that evidence with, this, with the scales of the narratives that we have about ancient and medieval Eurasia. Because as I will explore, the Silk Road is, at its heart, it's a story. It's an it's a amazing story um, and a rich one that, it, like, that is told in different ways in different places. Um, but something that I, I have done a lot of thinking and reading and writing about in particular is the way that the Silk Road exists as what I call a literary space-time. It is, a, it is a landscape and it is a, a historical narrative that has been written and dreamed and imagined as much as it has been lived and perhaps um, in, many, in many ways more so. Um, and so especially, which this is in particular, in particular relevant to the lives of people living in the middle parts of Eurasia, places like the Caucasus, because the Silk Road as a story is frequently told by people who's like in, in centers elsewhere. And in cities that are um, that are far away from from their daily lives, um, and and by people who are um, telling very grand narratives of grand movements and adventure, like the story of Alexander, um, which draw upon and and cast imaginative nets around the lives of people living in places like the Armenian highlands and the Caucasus mountains. So, for instance, I'm going to start with this amazing image, which is from the end, like the sort of um, the like the latter temporal span of my work from the 14th century. Um, this is an illustration from uh, Rashid al Din's Compendium of Histories, which was created in the Ilkhanid capital of Tabriz. And it shows this scene, this famous scene from the Alexandrine romance of Alexander and his, um, his soldiers disappearing into the land of darkness. And the land of darkness is an old medieval idea, a popular medieval idea that shows up in, in fiction, but also in geography and in accounts um, which are treated as more factual, such as Ibn Battuta's accounts of the lands of the Bulgars, from the, also from the 14th century, and from John de Mandeville's much less factual account of um, lands, to the, lands to the east, right? These fu fundamental sources we have on the image of the east in the minds of um, Western European writers. And what's um, funny, especially about the land of darkness in um, John de Mandeville's account is that it is situated near the Caucasus. It situates the peoples of Armenia and the Caucasus as near the edge of things, right? Near the part of the map where things get murky. Um, and it um, early on, like really underscored to me that um, the kind of that juxtaposition between the stories that are told about these places situated along the road which are the edges of the known for people who are situated in Tabriz or, um, or Mecca or um, Paris or London, but for the people who live there are absolutely the center of their stories. Um, and this really, um, this is like, this is a fundamental fact to, to consider when we think about our sources, the historical sources we have for the 13th century, the, the long Mongol 13th century, which um, for me, like kind of encompasses my work, punctuates the period that I look at in Armenia um, from the expansion of the Mongol um, Mongol uh, armies in the early decades of the 13th century um, into the end of the 14th century. And our sources from this period, of course, we have we have many, um, but like the, the famous ones, the highlights, the the greatest hits include stories like that, um, narratives like that written by um, William of Rubruck, the Franciscan friar who was sent as a deputy by uh, the King of France to the court of the of the Mongols, um, and also, of course, like that of Marco Polo. And both of these are linear journeys. They are long adventure stories gone 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 on by more or less heroic. Like William of Rubruck is a less heroic. Marco Polo definitely a more heroic um, Silk Road adventurer. And they and in reading these are the the narratives that shape our, our historical our shared historical imagination of a plate of, of the Silk Road as a place if it exists as a place. Um, but what is fascinating for me about thinking uh, about historical approaches to these narratives is the, is the way that we can think of them not only as telling 
stories of things that happened in time, but also as generating the Silk Road as a particular kind of place. Um, particularly drawing on the work of people like John Larner, like who emphasizes that, for instance, the story of Marco Polo is not so much about a journey that goes from west to east and back again, but is a story of the world that's organized in the form of a journey from west to east and back again. And so it is in turning the pages of that story that we feel ourselves traveling in a way that potentially bears less resemblance to the route that Marco Polo actually took um, to places that it is still debated whether he went at all. And so for this, for me, is a provocative thought um, that makes me think about the ways that, um, that the Silk Road is always an imaginary before um, on the part of the people who are traveling through it, but more importantly, that it is a, a, that the shape of these stories has shaped the research questions about the Silk Road and the encounter with the place, places between Jerusalem and Japan on the part of people coming who are, who, you know, people, travelers like Oral Stein, who carried a copy of Marco Polo's um, account of the world with him into the deserts of the Taklamakan. Um, and so this, so, and this is kind of visually summed up to kind of the, one of the, like, a helpful kind of shorthand for the ways that these spaces and times invoke and kind of call upon the lives of people who live along the road. Um, you can see in, in a lot of the paintings of the Orient Orientalist tradition. I like looking at this one. This really like dry, drives home for me what I'm trying to, what the, the kind of opposition that I'm trying to get out of, which again, coming back to the Silk Road in the everyday, which is an opposition between the, the, the narratives and the, and the kind of um, historical stories that are told about the travelers on the road who are on adventures, and the people that they pass by, that they perhaps don't even, don't notice or describe in their accounts, who are not part of their adventures, but who no, nonetheless live and populate and make possible um, life along the side of the road. So you can see here in this great um, kind of depiction of a fantastical Algeria by um, Charles, Charles Theodore Freire. You see this opposition between, oh, I have a pointer. Um, between the the caravan, which is you know called the departure, the the this mystical moment when the caravan leaves, you know, in, in this great pomp and circumstance, leaves uh, to depart on the Hajj or trade caravan or wherever they're going. And, and so like the kind of linear adventure narrative of these, of these um, caravan travelers, all of whom are men, is juxtaposed with the kind of the cyclical lives of going to the well, of fetching water, of doing chores, of these people who are being left behind. Of course, I'm not it's easy to read too much into a painting like this, but the kind of this is a, a kind of metaphorical narrative shorthand for the for the kind of the juxtapos juxtaposition and the apparent opposition between Silk Road travel and everyday life that I've been working to um, to collapse or to break down a little bit, and and has informed my approach to people who are written about again as living along the side of the road, but for for whom their own, like, but who were in their own stories, in their own narratives about um, the world of the 13th and 14th centuries are the heroes. They live in the center of their world. And of course, I'm talking about the Armenians, um, the, or um, people, uh, Armenian speakers and writers of the, of the 13th and 14th century who are the focus of my research. And so you can see here, here's some maps for you to situate us within the heart of the Caucasus. You can see on this, these inset maps, um, these are some, some of the trade routes which were re, uh, reconstructed by um, the Soviet um, Armenian historian Hakob Menandian, um, just to kind of give, of, of course, like this is an incomplete map of, of routes through this region. Um, and the area I'm going to be talking about is north of the modern city of Yerevan is here. Um, and the, my, the focus of my research is in the valley of the Cossack River, which cuts east of the giant volcanic peak, peak of uh, Aragox, you can see Ar Mount Ararat is here. This is the Arox River. Um, and this is like the center. And so this area here is now, is like this valley here. This is the peak of Mount Aragox. And this is the, the valley of the Cossack River, which you can see flowing, well, flowing down into the, into the valley, the Ar valley of the Ararat Plain. Um, and just to point out here, um, to situate in space, the chevrons or the diamonds on this map are the locations of Caravanserai is built by Armenians. And I'm going to come back to these, of course. This is forms the center of my narrative. The inns built for the caravans um, to house caravans passing through the Republic of Armenia. Um, and I just want to underscore these are those that are recorded by um, Vrazdat Haratunyan. So these are only the caravanserai built by Armenians. And so you can imagine these, these routes going in either direction um, as the road is picked up by polities on either side. Um, 
Great. Um, so again, Armenia and the Armenians, the territory of Armenia plays itself plays a role as a place encountered by travelers coming in both directions. And what has been fascinating to me in reading, as I you know, have, um, have worked in Armenia for now more than a decade and, um, and read encounters in Armenia and, and accounts of journeys to Armenia from, you know, from the Middle Ages up until, um, well, actually from the classical period up into the 19th and early 20th century, I'm struck by the, the way that Armenia is constructed as a place with a particular kind of temporality and a, and a historical narrative of its own. This was really summed up for me in this amazing engraving um, by the French traveler Jean Chardin, who traveled all the way through Persia um, you know, in the, in the grand old style of the 17th century, visiting the capitals of the Safavid Persian Empire. And you can see this is his, um, his engraver's uh, sketch of the, of the city of Yerevan um, from the, I mean, I'd like to think it is from the, um, uh, the foothills of Aragas looking over the city. Um, but I think this is actually from the Gagam Mountains. But what is, what I love about this engraving, what, and it's, it's in the book for this reason, is that you can see, this is the peak of Mount Ararat, and you can just barely see in this re reproduction of this engraving, Noah's Ark, which is perched jauntily on the peak of Mount Ararat. And so what I love about this is that collapse of the, this encounter with Armenia and the Armenians in, in the narrative of Jean Chardin, which is like in traveling to Armenia, he has traveled to biblical times. Right. He has traveled to a land where Noah's Ark has always just touched down. Um, and this is a frequent, um, a frequent technique of travelers to Armenia, which is thought of, uh, which is thought of as an ancient and biblical land. Um, travelers like um, Tavernier, the, the um, French jewel trader and statesman, um, Tavernier like, goes and visits the, the sword um, of Longinus, which is held in, um, at, at that point at Echmianzin in the valley, which is, um, yeah, over here. Um, and so the evocation of Armenia, both in the early modern period and up into the Soviet period, and the, the Russian imperial and Soviet, even Soviet period, is a kind of land out of time. Um, and in particular, um, there's this juxtaposition of modern, which is classic in a lot of these um, Orientalist accounts, a juxtaposition between modern Armenia, um, which is a kind of a backwater of the Persian and Ottoman empires, and the kind of glory of the biblical events and the ancient past of Armenia, um, which is an in interesting way to kind of situate Armenia, again, by the side of the road of, of the, the grand story of um, world civilization that is being passed from east to west and back again um, in the minds of many of these early modern travelers. But Armen medieval Armenians lived in their own world, at the center of their own universe, and on their own timeline. And just to share a chunk of this timeline for you guys, and to sort of let you know um, where I'm situated, um, again, just to punctuate this a bit. So the phenomenon of medieval Armenia and the Caucasus more generally is that it is, again, while it is the center of the world for the people living there, um, you know, it is is both you know the, the heart of divine creation and this and the like location of the the entirety of the historical narrative for Armenian historians. It is also like at the edge and overrun by the frontiers of multiple polities over the middle over the course of the Middle Ages, from um, of course the Arab conquest in the seventh century after you know and by the tenth century Armenia is constituted as a frontier of the Arab caliphates. Um, and thought of as, as again, a border region, dangerously close to the Bab al Abwab, the gate of gates behind which Alexander penned um, Gog and Magog. So, like the the edge of things, um, and close to the um, close to the, the the limit of civilized of the civilized world. Although travelers like Mukadasi are very um, praise highly Armenian crafts and trade and um, leather goods and textiles and and such. But it's still it's an edge. Um, like likewise, um, but then over the over the next several centuries, our, um, the Armenian highlands are incorporated within the Seljuk um, Sultanate, um, and then right at the beginning of my story, um, the Seljuk the Rum Seljuk Sultanate um, kind of uh, retreats into Anatolia, and um, Armenia is uh, uh, sorry is conquered by the Georgian Bagratids, so it becomes incorporated very briefly within um, a Christian kingdom once again. Um, again, after a brief 
a brief period, which is not even on here. Uh, I'm so embarrassed. My Armenian colleagues would never forgive me uh, when during, uh, of the Bagratid kingdom, which I'll mention in a second, um, which, is a very, which is a small uh, client kingdom between sandwiched, wedged between Byzantium and um, the Arab world. Um, but the period I want to look at is, um, again, right on either side of the Mongol invasions of the Caucasus. So this period um, where Armenians are acutely aware of their situatedness um, in a changing world. Um, and so essentially this, the period of the de dedication of, of caravanserai as I'll be looking at is between um, the early, the very first decades of the 13th century and then the middle of the 14th century. As, and um, so it was a period where Armenians, as I explore in the book and as I am exploring in my ongoing work um, in Southern Armenia, a period when Armenians are actively writing um, a new account of themselves, a new history for themselves in the context of a, of a drastically changing world, a, a, a world with new centers uh, and edges. Um, and um, just to give you guys some now some amazing, beautiful depictions of architecture from this period, this is the earlier fortress of Anbird, which perches and overlooks the Arad Plain from the southern slopes of Aragats from this earlier um, 9th and 10th century. And then these are the, this is the church of Haric, Haric Monastery, which is on the northern flank of Aragats that was built again by Zakaria and Ivana Zakarian, the, the generals of this triumphant um, expansion. And then this is um, Hofanavank, which I will discuss is, is built by the hero of my, one of the heroes of my story, the local prince, um, Vache Vachichan, um, who I'll be returning to in a moment. Um, again, like I said, this is uh, some visual shorthands and some, I'm always happy to, so excited to share um, imagery from medieval Armenia, kind of visual shorthand for, again, the way that Armenians in this, across this period are negotiating their identities and relationship to, to, um, to far-flung polities and capitals of empires situated outside of the Caucasus. So this is this famous depiction of Sambar and Gurgen Bagratuni, these Prince brothers from their um, and they're holding a model of the monastery that they themselves dedicated at Hakpat, which is north of the Cossack Valley. Um, and you can see um, the like dif distinctively um, uh, Arab influenced clothing to denotate like their kingliness, their princeliness between the um, even a um, turban with an Arab inscription, a Kufic inscription in it. And again, the way that they're portraying themselves as, as situated between the Byzantine and the Arab worlds. Fast forward to the early 14th century, again, the kind of end bracket of the period I'm looking at. This is a picture of Ayachi e. Procyon um, from Svitakavor, which is down in Vyazor, close to the what is now the border with Iran. And you can see by at this point, Armenians have literally turned have literally turned here is mid Parthian shot from the back of this horse and are portraying themselves as as beautiful, powerful Mongols. They are part of a Mongol world and like and have it, have taken on the um, the kind of trapping the trappings of power literally in the um, the cross um, cross breasted uh, silken robe and the belt of honor um, taken on the. The, the robes of honor, they've invested themselves as Mongol subjects and Mongol, um, Mongol princes. And so this is the kind of practice of negotiation that frames the, my encounters and investigations of everyday life in Armenia. The idea that at, the, at fundamental material levels of dressing the body of, mat of material cultural and artifacts and the everyday practices of getting dressed even, even the most powerful agentive Armenians are themselves negotiating um, a changing world. Um, um, even and and I also love the juxtaposition of the the idea of of this clothing and material culture all against the walls of these churches that they're building. Um, so, to, but to give you guys a, a get get you go, get you on the ground and get you closer to uh, the archaeological digs, um, I'm going to take you on a, a short branch of one of these journeys. Um, and to kind of walk you into the Cossack Valley. And to do so, I'm going to start in a, one of the most famous sites um, from medieval Armenia, which is of course, in, did not look like this in the Middle Ages, which is the city of Ani, which is currently now on the very Eastern border of Turkey um, on the Ahurian River. And in the 13th century, Ani was a metropolis, a trade center, an entrepot. Um, we know from the, uh, the epigraphic record that is carved on Every wall. I mean, if if 
if inscriptions have, if architectural inscriptions have voices, then like Ani is a, is a, just a, a town that is yelling all the time, um, like many medieval cities, especially in this part of the world. So from the inscriptions that cover the walls of the myriad of churches and mosques and, um, uh, and city walls at Ani, we know that it is a center of, um, of trade wealth and the, like the, um, Astro, like the sort of meteoric rise of um, of um, merchants who are rising to prince-like status on the strength of their participation in the silk, in Silk Road trade. Um, it is lined; the streets are lined with mer um, with um, market stalls, and the the wealth that is amassed from its position astride a major trade route and a kind of crossroads between. Um, the Mediterranean and the Northern Caucasus and the Black Sea coast on, in, in one direction, and then also between you know, Istanbul, Constantinople, um, and, uh, and Iran in the other direction, this wealth is channeled into donations and into the support and patronage of buildings. So here we are in this massive trade city, um, but, and, but we're leaving and setting out on a road to the east, heading over the shoulder and around the southern slopes of Aragats. And our ultimate destination is Tbilisi. Tiflis, um, which here's another um, illustration from Jean Chardin for you. But Tbilisi, like located north, a uh, north up through the mountain passes of Armenia, of course, is um, described by uh, Marco Polo at this time, as he says, "quote um, Tiflis is surrounded by subordinate towns and townships. The inhabitants are Christians, Armenians, and Georgians, besides a few Saracens and Jews, but not many. Silk and many other fabrics are woven here." and the inhabitants live by their industry and are subject to the great Khan, the Tartars, right? So we have this account of Tbilisi from Marco Polo that like situates us both in terms of the plurality of the Caucasus, the multiple communities that are living there, but also the relationship between these cities and the Mongol ecumen. So this is our destination. We set out along the road. And one of the first sites that we pass as we move across the southern shoulder of Aragats is the medieval fortress of Dashtadam. I really love this, these engravings because they, again, they perform that great orientalist trick of situating the ruins of the past um, along with this epic landscape, and then that they insert these ethnographic figures for scale in the, in the, in the foreground. Um, but if you want to learn more about Dashtadam, my good friend my, and collaborator, Ostrich Babajanian, has been excavating there for now for many years and has, has recovered the remains of this period in the late 13, um, the early 13th century of the use of this fortress as part of the Zakharid Bagratuni um, frontier. But of course, by the time we are traveling in the mid 13th century, this is no longer a frontier. We are in the heartlands of the, um, the Mongol world. And so this fortress is now um, a center, also a center of production and trade and a seat of the local lords. But we're gonna pass it by and continue along the Southern slopes of Aragats um, until we come to around five o'clock on the, if the, this giant volcanic mountain is a clock face. And we start entering a landscape that has been recently constructed, like so, so, so recently that you can smell the sawdust and this almost smell the stone dust in the air from the construction of buildings like this um, monastery on the left, which is called Terer, which was um, dedicated in 1213. And then also sites like this monastery of Ushi, which is both of these are um, to like rise along the mountain slope to your left as you travel on the road along the road around the, the around the slope um, the shoulder of the mountain. Both of these monasteries were founded on the sites of fifth century martyria, honoring the remains and relics of the um, martyrs of the conversion and the saints of the conversion period in Armenia, which is of course one of the oldest Christian countries in the world. Um, and by the 13th century, already the the martyria, the shrines built on the bones of their saints were in ruins. And one of the projects of these um, relatively neophyte houses of princes, such as the Vachichans, um, under the leadership of Vajay Vachichan, was to rebuild and glorify and enlarge these monasteries um, and to rededicate them to the memory of the saints. So reinscribing themselves in the history of Christian medieval Armenia. Um, and so you can see, um, so, but we're not stopping here either. We're gonna keep going. Um, and pass up the slope and into the valley of the Cossack River, which I pointed out earlier. And here we are standing actually on, a, um, on this left-hand picture. We are actually standing on the ramparts of a Bronze Age fortress. 
um, over looking down over the slopes of Aragats, looking east over the river, the, the Cossack River, which is at this point buried in this deep canyon running under this mountain. And this mountain is Mount Ara or Arailer, um, which is mentioned in, again, one of the more famous linear kind of adventure stories of this period, which is the, the account of the travels of King Hetem, of uh, the king of the Cilician Armenians, from his court to the court of the Mongols in order to pay tribute as one of the now kings of kings who are subjects to the Mongols. And in his account, he travels, he passes by all the, I mean, he may have paid, uh, paid a visit to the monasteries, passes up and through this valley and stays, as he accounts, in the house of the Vachuchans and of Vache Vachuchan in the shadow of the mountain of Ara. And so as he's doing so, he's being hosted by this um, family who is in the process, has been already by, by that point in the latter decades of the 13th century, in the process of making their mark in this landscape. Here again is the monastery of um, Hovanavank. This is um, yet another monastery, which is located down in the bottom of this canyon called Asvatsen Kal. And around and across the valley, um, one, of, like, one of the things I look at in, um, in my archaeological surveys is the construction of this um, sense of um, a, a rich and interconnected landscape of tradition and history that is tied to the destiny of this family. Um, and Hetem passes by and stays in the castle of Vachichan, but we're not so lucky. And we're going to peel off the road halfway up the, the slope of Mount Aragats, and um, where you are greeted now by this rather ro romantic ruin. Um, which is the remains uh, of a caravan inn at Arai, um, at this town called Arai Bazojuk, or Arai on Soviet maps, which was recorded in a slightly more complete state in 1960 um, as part of the compendium of Armenian caravans arise. Before we walk through the door, I want to just lay out, zoom out for a second and discuss the importance of the caravanserai, the Khan, the Khan, the Sarai, the road inn in medieval and early and into early modern cosmopolitics. Again, because a caravanserai is not just a hotel. I mean, I really love hotels and motels, like the weirder the better, but even beyond like for, even, uh, even with my love of the motel, a caravanserai is more than a motel. Um, within, we have um, like overlapping writings on, the, on politics and the kind of obligations of rulers across the, Christian, Islamic, and um, Buddhist worlds in this period underscore the importance of hospitality and the construction of um, housing for strangers, travelers, needy, and others, foreigners, um, as central to the practice of good politics. Right? This, is, this is fundamental to piety and to politics for the Karahanids, for the Seljuks, for the Safavids, um, and so I'm giving you guys a, a sample here of, um, of caravanserais from across, both across, yeah, I, I get across the, the core of the Silk Road world and also across some of these traditions. So we have here the Aksarai Sultan Han, um, which is one of the, the most famous uh, Seljuk caravanserais from um, Anatolia. Um, here uh, is the, uh, and on the other kind of other end, bracketing this temporal period, this is the Behistun caravanserai built by the Safavids. Uh, in Iran, of course, in a um, like like a, a you can almost you can see the inscriptions behind it. Obviously, in a in a, a very time deep point in the landscape under these um, Achaemenid inscriptions. Um, and then I also have like this is uh, the um, one of the uh, Mughal um, khans built. Uh, this one is on the outskirts of Lahore. Um, and I also included again like the way that obviously beyond their significance as um, models of the world in. Uh, in the Middle Ages, of course, like caravans rise continue to be significant. But to underscore that, in in writings from the um, from the Karahanid period, from the 11th century to the um, 17th century in the Safavid context, we see over and over again the use of the caravan in as a metaphor both for the world and also for the soul, for the for the um, for the span of human life, right? In the, in the nested microcosmic way that medieval people thought about the worlds and their bodies and um, and their own lives. And so caravanserais are, are used as a metaphor, as a kind of, um, as, a, as a miniature of the entirety of human experience and the entirety of, um, you know, the world as we know it, which of course means both that they have a, a nice 
Um, they serve as really handy metaphors and are and that adds an, an, an added frisson to being in one of them. But it also means that to build a caravanserai is more than a kind of um, more than an infrastructural obligation, which is um, it is an act of making a world, which for me is fundamental to um, to make a world for other people to live in is fundamental to the, the practice of cosmopolitanism, right? This capacity to be an actor in the world, to get things done and to recruit other people to your projects, or in particular, to recruit the people who visit your, if you are a prince, a sultan, a shah, um, to invite people into a world that you have built is a profound act of sovereignty um, with connotations for violence as guest host relationships have had um, going back into ancient Greece, of course. Um, and so there is so much val so much significance and meaning laden onto these spaces, even just at the time that they open their doors, which is why um, caravanserais from um, across these contexts have um, really uh, intense and detailed and powerful donation inscriptions uh, and carved on them in many cases. Um, which are either um, signifying them as pious donations within uh, a walk culture, uh, for instance, in the in the Seljuk world, or designating them as a project of the king, such that you are, by walking through their gates, you are receiving the hospitality of your ruler. And it doesn't matter if you're foreign to that place for the time that you spend inside the walls of a caravan in, you are a subject to that, to that local king, no matter how... Um, how grand the scope of their empire might be, which again has major implications if you are a local prince in an Armenian whose territory is a couple of valleys in the central Armenia in the 13th century. So um, it's with those buildings in mind that I, uh, uh, I led a team in 2011 to excavate the caravanserai at Arai Bazurchuk. And of course, I wasn't expecting it to look like uh, the Aksarai Sultan Han. Um, honestly, we had very little expectations. And you can see this is what we found um, through this caravanserai, I think, fell down in the uh, as a result of a fairly catastrophic earthquake. Um, and so it meant that the um, while very little, very little of the walls remained standing, the floors were, were preserved. Um, very nicely. Um, trust me, this is nice. Um, so what you're seeing is that wall, that wall, which is the northern wall of the back, northern wall of the caravan in from a couple of different angles. So, um, but basically all, more or less, all of these images are facing north. And you can see all three of these trenches in this image. So this is near the center of the building. And then you can see one, two is one and two showing these la the lateral sides. And I mean, it's hard to explain, like looking at these pictures, like doesn't do justice to the process of figuring, of descending down through two meters of um, excavation and um, re coming upon these contexts and, and putting together their significance kind of in archeological time, excavation time. Um, so, uh, so, which is why like the, I still like have a sense of wonder when I look at these images and think about like, as we were figuring out um, what they represent, which is, so this is the central gallery of the caravanserai, and you can barely see the remains of the join of the central archway of what would have been a three-arch structure, as I'll show you in a moment. And so this, this is a central gallery um, between, uh, and this is the left-hand side of bases of arches, the central gallery, which is like lined with packed, nice packed red clay, you can see a little bit more of it here, and then the, the outer kind of um, galleries of this, imagine almost the same form as a basilica church. The outer galleries, ooh, no, here we go. Uh, the outer, outer galleries slope outward and downward and are lined with, these are mangers that run the length of this building. And, um, and you can actually even see barely here this little narrowing point where holes were packed through the edge of these mangers to tether um, horses and camels. And so ultimately the image we have this is a cross section that I um, drew from the architectural drawings and elevations. We have a building that is both for humans and for animals. And so, which is another fascinating aspect of this, which is the hospitality, that project of cosmopolitanism that is enacted by the buildings of these structures was not just for human beings, but also, of course, for their animals and for their goods as well, right? This is a hospitality directed at the, all of the material and living worlds of the Silk Road. And you can see again, um, those sloping galleries to the outside where animals would have been tethered and they would have gone the length of the building and then the central area, which is where we found not only, um, we didn't find people, um, uh, just 
delightful deep deposits of garbage, including the remains of um, dishes in which um, meals were served at the caravanserai, and even little bits of um, burned, uh, scorched clay where small fires would have been built. And also my osteologist, the osteologist working with us, like delighted in finding even the bones of starlings, which had nested in the rafters of this building at some point. Um, so you can imagine, I like to imagine the smoke from little fires in the, in the evening when the doors had been shut. And of course it's smelly and full of the smell of animals and humans and tired, you know, tired species of all kinds and the smoke rising into, there would have been a skylight here, smoke rising um, and being crisscrossed by birds and bats and all kinds of other folks. And so this is a, a standing caravanserai in at Hargis, which is towards along the highway towards Unique in the now um, conflict uh, uh, in crises region of Sunik uh, near the border. Um, and so this is looking, turning your back to that northern wall and looking back out towards the door. This is the main door above which is a monumental inscription from the donor of this caravanserai in the, 13th, in the 14th century. And so you can see here those three arched galleries. Again, the idea that there's an, and a single door, which of course was shut and locked at night. Okay. Um, and here is an even more evocative image from a couple of years ago from the Selim Caravanserai, which um, is just over this just exhausting mountain pass going from the, the windy hills around Lake Sevan, descending into the um, beautiful pass. And I mean, I think they're beautiful because I work there and I love them, but the beautiful um, vineyard lined uh, canyons of Vyadzor. And so again, we're looking from, this one is oriented east-west, but we're looking from that back wall towards the, the doorway here. Um, and you can see this one also has mangers on the side for animals. And this just to, to tie us back in, to bring us back to those arguments about, about cosmopolitan hospitality and local power um, and politics in Armenia. This is the, there are two inscriptions on this caravanserai, which is also on the cover of the book um, because it's amazing. Um, and I am in love with this building. Um, as uh, one of the, there are two inscriptions, one of which is in Persian and one, is, and one of which is in Armenian. And the Persian inscription is on the outside of the building and is a little bit shorter, um, and, uh, but says essentially the same thing, but in much less detail. The Armenian inscription is inside at eye level so that you can almost touch it as you walk into this building just, in, just outside this doorway in a little antechamber. Anti and this proclaims the, like, proclaims the hospitality and the piety of the donor of this building, Chesa Orbelian, son of Prince of Princes Liparad and Anna, grandson of Ivane. He, you know, he, um, in the style of wakf inscriptions and of church donation inscriptions, he um, recites all of his forebears as well as listing his um, his br brothers and sons. Um, as he says, built built this spiritual house, Hogetun, for the um, and refers to the caravanserai as a spiritual endowment. Um, I say car caravanatun is Armenian for caravanserai. Um, and then in particular, beseeches you, the travelers, us, um, to remember them in our prayers, which again is, is, a real, uh, is a real act of sovereignty in many ways, an act of power, a, a power move um, on the part of these princes that their hospitality, which is get freely given, is, does come at with an expectation, right? Like there's, there's no, there is uh, in the, in, according to, in accordance with like anthropological models of the gift, like from Marcel Moss and others, a gift always comes with an expectation and that expectation carries forward in time. And in the case of these caravan inns in Armenia as, and elsewhere, that expectation is, is linked to the memory of the traveler. In, and is housed, therefore, in their traveling body. And this is repeated over and over again um, in the preserved inscriptions that we have from, from this genre of building in this period. Um, the caravanserai at R.I. Bazarjuk had no inscription. Um, so, like, it is, I, so um, I can only, through kind of indirect um, relationships, tie it in, therefore, with the projects of Vache Bachuchan. But that wasn't enough for me, and I found myself still curious about the the, the way that that caravanserai space was enmeshed within the everyday life of other people. And it was with this in mind that a team of um, colleagues and I started excavations. You can see the caravanserai here. You can see our backfill pile even. Um, caravanserai is here, and a mere stone's throw, a hop, skip, and a jump up the valley, um, and 
is the the medieval village contemporary with the with the caravanserai and and honestly because of the um intensive soviet agricultural in this region you should imagine the this these are the you can see the remains here in this aerial photo this village would have enc enclosed the caravanserai and in the course of excavations there, we found out more about the lives of people living in this village. And in particular, so here you can see their living floors there. These are tonier ovens, um, which are still used obviously for making um, lavash bread and cooking all kinds of food and firing pots and doing all kinds of um, household maintenance, everyday work in Armenia. You can see, so we found out a lot about their lives and about their material relationships with that space, that adventure space of the caravanserai. I remember hearkening back to that Orientalist painting, that distinction between the people who are, you know, the, the women getting water, the locals who are doing, you know, who are carrying out the, the chores of everyday life, and that, that adventure that, the, that caravan travelers are on. But looking at the material culture, and I'm going to this very briefly, um, what, I, what we found, um, Ostrich and I looking at these ceramics back, back in the day in the Institute of Archaeology, was that the meals, we had strong um, ceramic evidence and uh, and also bone and seed evidence that the meals that are served to travelers in the caravanserai were of course made by these local people, that that they were performing their own acts of hospitality and, and in so doing were performing their own acts of small, smaller scale agency and power. But when I say smaller scale, like that's that's a little bit complicated because of course, in feeding someone a meal, you're also entering into that similar relationship of expectation and futurity that a prince like Vache Vatuchan or Cesar Abelian um, is also entering into by extending their hospitality, right? You are, you are sustaining the body of the traveler, you are giving them a memory, and you're filling them with memories that they're going to carry on with them uh, along the road. And that will kind of, will have their own complicated space, like temporality as they remember the meal that they ate, the stories that they listen to while sitting sitting underneath uh, in that smoky caravan inn, and and will be you know sustained like they're the, they might not remember you with their prayers, but they will remember you uh, in and in a, in a kind of a benedictive way in the memory of that meal eaten. And so this is interesting for me. So now I hear I've come back to the compendium of histories um, and this Im nice image of um, of a feast being prepared and all of these um, co this combination of um, of pots and smaller bowls, just, I mean, I'm not drawing a direct link, but the combination of cooking pots we have here, both from, um, these are from the village and these are from the caravanserai, the fragments of them, you can see these are little rim fragments that we found in, both in the home, in the houses, and also on the floor broken in the gutters. And likewise, these little, these are all of, all of these, you can see this, these are 10 small bowls that would have been, you could, um, hold in one cradle in one hand, um, all of which were um, slipped in bright red um, flip of fine clay um, to make them gleam in the light and really, um, really like demonstrate an attention to, to making an enticing and beautiful meal out of the stew, the I think harissa of seeds and bone and um, fat and um, chopped up bones that we found deposited in the in the kind of the garbage area of the caravanserai. And so again, like for me, this um, the where this takes me is thinking in more complicated ways about who who we are telling stories about when we try set out to tell stories of the of the Silk Road, um, and in particular, the way that as archaeologists and interdisciplinary historians, the scales of our data, whether it's um, historical texts, whether it's inscriptions on the walls of buildings whether it's the buildings themselves and their remains. Um, and of course, I'm showing examples here of um, incredibly uh, incredibly grandiose structures. Like this is the, the interior, the painted interior of the monastery of uh, Grigor Lusevorich at Ani. Um, and that's ex exterior here, very grand buildings. And also, but, and these inter intermediate, uh, intermediate structures like these caravanserai, as well as the ceramic materials that we find inside them, all of these, tell stories at different scales and demand that we think about, um, you know, human memory and human imagination the, uh, at different, um, at different, at different spatial and temporal scales, right? The experience of the Silk Road for um, the person cooking a meal in one of these pots over one of those tonier ovens and carrying it 
um, to the caravanserai to serve um, to yet another stranger um, is different than the experience of the prince who is donating. This is the inscription of Tigran Honens at, um, at Ani, who donates in the course of this inscription a couple of caravanserais, right? He, ha he donates a, the, just, I think it's three um, caravanserais um, and their incomes uh, to the maintenance of this monast monastic um, institution, right? Their experiences are very different, but they're both important and they're both agentive and, um, and necessary in the construction of this phenomenon, this global culture we call the Silk Road. Um, and I also love, I mean, I, I kind of just referenced it to it. I, the, for me, like something fascinating is that reversal for which, by, by according to which like those travelers, those adventuring caravaneers for the maintainers of the caravan inn, for the villagers at um, villagers living in the Cossack Valley, they are everyday life. Every day brings another caravan of traders and merchants and Franciscans and missionaries and um, delegate delegates and soldiers and slaves up the, up and down their valley. Right, this is part of the rhythm of their everyday lives. But that only becomes visible to us if we shift our perspective from the road itself to these um, places that that are constructed alongside it, but in turn also construct that road. Um, I am out of time. Um, I'm going to stop there uh, because I most I want to talk more about this, and I never I always look so forward so much to, to the questions I get about this work, um, which always shine new light on it for me. So I'm going to selfishly stop and make and listen to your questions. Um, I want to thank all of my colleagues, um, but also um, definitely um, Allison and Maddie and Susan and all and all of everyone involved in inviting me here, um, which is already a delight, and I know it's only going to get better. Um, thank you. That was um, fascinating, and there's lots and lots of questions I want to ask, but I can ask you after, so I'm going to hand the floor over to others. Those of you on Zoom, if you want to put your questions on the chat, and then we can read them out, and um, Kate will answer them, so yes. we will get that up in a minute. But are there any questions here from the floor? Kate, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, I think so certainly in the case of um, it's a we have a, an evidentiary challenge in Armenia. So colleagues of mine who work in on the But we, there is discussion in law codes and, and political writings from this period that these should be free, that, that to stay in a caravanserai in most cases for most people was free. And there are, um, there's a fantastic law code from this period um, written by Mehtar Ghosh that um, emphasizes that especially um, that noble travelers should uh, stay in caravanserais where they can, you know, be kind of outside of, rather than like taking up the hospitality of monasteries, for instance. And so it's like, yeah, keep yourself in the in the caravanserai. Um, but yeah, so like, sorry, I'm getting slightly off topic. So such a, like, such a rich, rich sociality, but yes, like the idea being that like they are, um, they are providing hospitality and then you can, do you can donate, but ultimately, um, that the food it can be free, but there are also points of um, collecting taxes, of um, uh, you know, of, of carrying out trade and of collecting revenue. So like there is, there's a complex. I think it depends on when they're being used. Um, there's a complex kind of process there. Certainly in the Safavid world, you can see like um, in the, in the 17th and 18th century, the period in which like the donor's donation sustains the caravanserai might run out, and then. You know, someone might take it over and sell tickets or whatever. But like, yeah, the idea of it is it's free. Long-winded, long-winded answer. Sorry. Can I just step in and ask a question related yes. to that? Because if there weren't caravans, right, people would often say monasteries. Yeah. I, I'm just interested from the Buddhist world because we have experience of Buddhist travelers who are meant to be taken in by monasteries and given hospitality. Mm -hmm being chased away by the poor monks of very rural monasteries who can't afford to give them and don't want them to put them up for the night. Do we get examples of that? Yes, I am trying to remember the, the source of this. It's a 
like I, it is a Armenian monastic who's running this period and it's like it's these princes and their retinues and their dancing girls and their musicians and it's like don't yeah don't don't prevail upon the but and of course like staying in a monastery um from dur during this period like certainly uh, um i'm thinking comparison cases in um the uh in the levantine context like slightly earlier like staying in a monastery was was fun like especially and like i mean again i don't want to extrapolate across from between like the 10th century and the 13th century but like especially for the uh, the um uh my court to like go out and crash at a monastery and drink wine and like kind of like you know get rural was was fun and a, and a kind of risky thing to do and so i think like definitely the idea of being like oh yeah let's channel these away from the like let's create a place that is also under control but like a area for hospitality that's outside the monastic walls so it's like tra yeah travels it's liminal it's an adventure <laughs> we don't need them in here taking yeah taking hospitality <laughs> It's fascinating you talk and <coughs> wonderful images. Thank you. Um, but there's something that puzzles me about it. I wonder if you could say some more about it. Because you several times use phrases like cosmopolitan mm -hmm. and global culture mm -hmm. uh, to do with the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. But your story is about local engagement with people that are passing through. And I'm trying to bridge that, that gap between what is essentially about exchange of things mm -hmm. and things which are local and and provided and and do you have evidence about the spread of ideas the spread of artifacts the spread of styles mm. along this route which of course we know happen yeah of course um and so what what's the evidence what what is a, what, how does a media fit into that particular scenario i mean Awesome can question. Before you start, can I just say one other thing? Yeah. You, you presented this as being on the edge. Mm -hmm. It's the, on the edge for a certain view of centrality of Europe. Mm -hmm. but, but of course, there's, there are other, as indeed we know, uh, there are other ways of, of, of looking at, at, at the route. So. Absolutely. So again, I think, yeah, I think, uh, I get like one of the challenges that I find in even setting out to write anything about the Silk Road is, is, work, situ is kind of peeling back like some of the like perceptions of the Silk Road that like that created, I mean, of course, like I'm preaching to the choir in such a fundamental way here, right? But um, that cast it as a, as a route that has two, that like a string that's like hung between two posts across Eurasia, but of course that is in no way true. And, you know, this, this Silk Road is made and sustained and practiced all the way, you know, it, I mean, for me in so many ways to talk about where the Silk Road was, is just to start talking about Eurasia as a place, right? Because like, there's no, there, it is everywhere anyway. In terms of like the thinking about cosmopolitanism, um, I think certainly in archaeology, a tendency is when we talk about cosmopolitan people in the ancient world, the medieval world, we're talking about people who were exposed to difference and participated in trade, and from that experience um, derived a certain enlightenment. And um, you know, we think about um, cosmopolitanism as being synonymous with. Um, mutual, uh, um, sorry, um, uh, sorry, open-mindedness and mutual regard and, um, you know, kind of uh, a, a mutual respect for others and for difference, which is a very kind of 20th century definition of what, it, what for me, like, is really fundamentally to, like, understand yourself as living within a world that has centers and edges and other people in it who might be working, living within their own worlds. Um, and so in that definition, like, Obviously, like both what I what I try to underscore is that by and it's hard to to cover all of this in this talk, so read the book, everyone, um, is in undertaking these projects where they um in like so what these princes, all of these builders of caravans rise are essentially doing is saying that my world, my political world, my sovereignty, my kingdom includes all of the the lands that are crossed by these travelers because they enter into my caravanserai they are my subjects and so i am mistaking a claim to the, the the politics of this world which goes as far as karakoram and goes as far as venice and that's why they you know tiran honans donates sorry not tiran honans omeg of yerevan do, donates make sure he he states that he is donating venetian ducats to his monastery um do you want to jump in 
I see that hand. You're so excited. Okay, related question. It's like, wait, um, and another one over here. I mean, so again, so they are absolutely uh, per, per, like participating in this. Um, so I mean, even the very practice of building a career advance is cosmopolitan, as we see it is. It is participating in a culture that is increasingly is becoming shared. It transcends. Um, religion, and it is, you know, it, it is, it, it is one of the ideas, this idea of hospitality, of, of politics of hospitality is one of those Silk Road ideas that's, that's traveling along the route and in its traveling makes the Silk Road. That's, I love the chicken and egg aspect of that, which is, yeah, like one of the ideas that's, that's traveled along this route is the idea of travel as a metaphor for a discovery of the self. Um, and that, yeah, that by housing travelers, you are enabling, you know, practices of, of discovery and enlightenment. Um, but also on more fundamental levels, Yes, with the textiles and the architectural styles and you know forms of representation and all of these ideas are fundamentally yeah, they are present and they are discoverable. Um, but just not surprisingly um, in well, not, but not really all that surprisingly um, within the caravan story itself. I mean, I think that was like a great uh, you know, it was one of those ironies that like setting out to dig a caravan story, people said to me all the time like, oh, you're going to find spices and like you're going to find nutmegs. <laughs> you're going to have the floor is going to be covered in ducats and you know, I, like, I don't know, you know, shreds of Byzantine silk. I'm like, fundamentally, no, it's mostly manure actually. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you know, it is in the, in the, con the creating of the space that these people are, are they are engaged and they are undertaking, um, they're, they're, you know, making a play for the cosmopolitanism that we, that maybe I shouldn't say we in this company that like that more that kind of, um, reductive historians of this period tend to attribute to urban people living in the centers of the world, the centers of the world. But of course, this is the center of their world. I don't know who's okay. hands first. <laughs> I will do Lionel first at the back, and then we'll do the gentleman with one over here. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then these two on this middle row. Is it likely at this time that um, other people's knew Armenian, or was there a lingua franca? Ooh, good question. I mean, I think it's interesting uh, is that, uh, I mean, the, it's hard to talk about a lingua franca in a, re a region that is in the center on the edge all at the same time. So again, um, there are uh, just over the border, for instance, like there is a great trilingual inscription in, I'm gonna get this wrong, Syriac, Turkish, and Armenian. I mean, Armenian is itself a lingua franca for Armenia, the Armenian trade diaspora, which is expanding at this time um, and is tied between, you know, tying between Armenians in Cilicia and Armenians in the Armenian highlands and Armenians that are at the court of um, the Mongols and Karakoram. So like, I mean, but so, you know, the, that complicated way that like people themselves become like, become a vernacular and that Armenians are everywhere and start to serve as translators. Um, you know, uh, William of Rubrook discusses this. Persian is uh, already by the 14th century, um, Persian be is becoming, uh, you know, the, the language of politics. And so we have bilingual inscriptions on the Selim Caravanserai again, um, which are both, are Situ again, situating these people between their own their own folk, um, the people that they want to remember them in Christ you know, in Christian memory, because as well as a concern for yeah for other languages. So again, yes and no. Many language like many languages and a lot of um, polylingual at least people creating multilingual inscriptions, if not actually speaking in multiple languages. <laughs> Thank you. Great question. Yeah, well, my, I've never even heard of caravans arrived at full speed. I know, I mean, how far were they? Were they all the way from Venice to China, or were they just in Armenia? Yeah, Africa? all the way. I mean, again, I always feel a little bit guilty, but also, like, I feel like he would appreciate it, like, showing Faratunian's, like, quite Armenian nationalist distribution of caravans arrived, because, uh, yeah, they go from, I mean, um, Sorry, Mary Constable has a really great book called Housing the Stranger, which looks at a little bit earlier period. And basically that like this idea, the idea of the inn is is so basic to civility and to, you know, we talk, cosmopolitanism being a Greek idea, right? And the idea of hospitality, but that is also always at the same time politics. So these foundations for hospitality, you know, we have, you know, between the, what then become called hospitals in Jerusalem to right all, I mean, the density of Seljuk caravans rise in Turkey and, and told the broader what then was the Seljuk world is insane, right? It's like they are they were situated every every day's travel. Um, likewise, across uh, the work I've done on Safavid Persia, every single like 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 they just stamped across the landscape. Like every twenty, it's about 
a day's walk for a camel, which is about 20, 25 kilometers. And you, you know, they are uniform and they are everywhere and um, likewise. And, and where what we found, like I've done some work on the 17th and 18th century caravans rise in Afghanistan and into Pakistan is like where one empire like leaves off, another one picks up. And so we have this zone where, you know, a day's travel away from a Safavid caravansary, it's a Mughal caravansary. And so, you know, this again, back to cosmopolitanism, this is a shared project that I don't want to say it transcends these regional politics, because again, that's a, 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 that, a flat take on cosmopolitanism, but it is in a, in a sense, like it, it shows a, 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 shared, a shared culture, which is distributed across some very profound differences. Thank you. I'm, I'm fascinated with it by the idea of uh, the Silk Road as a series of loci rather than as a stream. And, uh, and, and the uh, interest in the idea of universal hospitality. Was there though, an underclass? Were there criminals? Were there bandits? Is there any difference for that? Oh, yeah. uh, uh, did they live in the villages or did they live elsewhere like bandits? This is, yeah, the things I forget to talk about. Um, but uh, like uh, in 45 minutes, um, Bandits everywhere. Yeah, just nonstop bandits. But also, like again, political instability. So you know, I'm you know, I'm a sort of grab bag of sources on this. Um, for instance, you have like Pendelotti's, the um, Genoese merchant Pendelotti's hand uh, uh, merchant handbook from the later the kind of mid 13th century as well. Is like you know, watch out because if these regions are frequently in a process of transition, you know, from you know one local prince is taking. Not speaking about the Cossack Valley, but like you know, regions like Armenia, it's like one prince is on the rise, another is on the on the outs. There's gonna, you know, they're running around like within the law code from the turn of the turn of this period, beginning of this period in Armenia. There are like specific, like there's a list of rules for like, okay, how do we divide up legitimate booty taken on the road? Right. So there are rules of engagement for um, for princes who become bandits, and you know how to like how do you donate the legitimate spoils of your banditry to the monastery to like, you know, to get right, right? Um, but also, yeah, like, um, you know, we have accounts from the, you know, from the Crusades of, you know, um, there's a great one that's in, I excerpt in the book where, yeah, banditry is more profitable than trade for many people. So yes, absolutely. And so the, the sense, also again, like back to the, the real politics and the real kind of stakes of this hospitality is not just like, you know, you know, y'all come back now, you hear kind of like hospitality. It's like this door, we are closing this door at night and we are keeping the enemy is outside and all of us, I mean, again, back to the metaphor of the caravans, right? Everyone who's locked inside those doors at night, like we are the good people, we are the world, right? Like we are, and that co very much cosmological aspect of architecture, which is like the thing that is beyond the locked doors is that's, you know, there be dragons, right? And so that that adds to the that definitely adds to the um, the valence of that hospitality. That there's a stakes there, like that's not safe outside. Thank you. Good critical question. Okay, I'm just going to take two more questions. Um, this lady here, and then the gentleman back, and then we're going to stop to give you a chance to have a drink. <laughs> Ooh, we could grab you there. Oh, seven 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 okay. Yes. yes Hi, I was curious about the food because oh. a lot of the Silk Road romances around the food, and there's all over the world restaurants named Silk Road. I mean, I mean, hey. So many restaurants called Silk Road. Yeah, yeah. and then, then food is also very focal in the crust of hospitality, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you think everyday food that you know you know you found in your story Yeah, very every day. You know, again, no saffron, no nutmeg, <laughs> no, no mace, so no cockatoo meat. Sorry. Um it, what we found was essentially, so again, I get into this because as much as I love motels, I also love diners um, as, a, as a Southern American. And the, it was basically like soul food. Like, and essentially what we found a lot of was, um, again, from the botanical evidence and then also the, um, the faunal, the animal, animal bone evidence is like all the animal bones were chopped into tiny broken little pieces to get the marrow out of them and all of the a lot of the botanical evidence was mostly um so this is charred plant remains that are found and you can imagine um either coming out of uh the dung that was being used to heat the fires but also coming out of the the remain the cooking the kind of debris from cooking and from you know bits of food that fall into the fire it's a lot of grains so barley and wheat and um so the idea of being like 
kind of recreating this image of not roasted meat, but like something that you would make by like stirring up, you know, the fatty cracked marrow bones um, in a in a thick, um, well, what is called harissa in Armenia now, like a really thick stew that like you know you ate, right? It's like something that like, <laughs> it, and then you put like clarified butter on the top of it or cream or you know, sour cream or yogurt or whatever. So it is fatty, it is dense, it is greasy. And like it, like, like I, I wasn't, like, when I say like, you will remember the meal and remember the, the person who fed it to you, like you'll be remembering that like, for, you know, well up the mountain. Is there literally evidence that also my skills have no Absolutely. Um, so yeah, which was like, that was like the, you know, the food of the masses in medieval Armenia, like really, like that's what, like if you have, you know, there are stories across the medieval Islamic and Christian worlds of like, you know, when, when kings or sultans like want to, like, they want to tell a story about themselves that they're like down with the, the common people, like they'll go and, you know, this is, this is in mirror, in mirror for princes, princes literature everywhere, like, if a sultan wants to de demonstrate themselves to be like both high and low, right? Like they are they are powerful, but also like democratic. They eat of common people's food. And in, Ar in Armenia, like that food with that valence is harissa. It's like, you know, like you're a you're one of the one of us if like you eat this. So like I think I think it's not incidental that there are these intersecting um, metaphorical intersecting symbolisms of like that food is like bringing as leveling people and also the caravanserai which also serves that same purpose in poetry and you know anecdotes about traveling kings who like go in and have this you know kings and holy men who have this leveling experience in this space right so it's also you know it's it's where everyone is kind of equal yeah okay last question uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a stimulating talk. I uh, look forward to it. It's whetting our appetite for the book. Yeah. And I do understand that you're completely unable to cover everything yeah. uh, in the book in, in a 45 minute uh, talk. But um, I, I was troubled by a few of your generalizations. Sure. And so obviously, when you write your book, it's going to be a little bit more mm -hmm. uh, nuanced, I think. Uh, it's sort of a mixed economy, isn't it, of caravanserais? It's a period of the 11th to the 14th century oh, that, that really we're talking about. It's not sort of forever hospitality. Yes, yes, yes. And it's also commercially. <laughs> there's a commercial side to it. You made a, a reference <laughs> to the uh, trilingual inscription mm -hmm. uh, in Malatya province in Turkey that's in Syriac, that's in Armenian and in Arabic. That's a for-profit caravanserai. Yes. Right? Um, and the endowment um, of the caravanserais um, in the uh, in the monastery in Ani, you know, is obviously for profit, mm -hmm. right? So it is your, you know, it is what you say it is, but also there's this other aspect to it that again, that's very difficult uh, to ascertain for lack of lack of evidence. Uh, but uh, they seem to operate; they seem to be operating at the same time in ways that we don't understand how they intersect. That's a, just a, a, a comment. Uh, then on to my main point, because I've been staring at these hotch cars. Oh, uh, yeah. And I'm really wondering, uh, I really wondered throughout your entire talk, why you were making things so difficult for yourself mm. by talking about uh, cosmopolitanism <laughs> and then emphasizing time after time after time the <laughs> Armenianness of where you're working. Mm. Uh, and... Um, you know, uh, there is a historical Armenia that, of course, is a lot bigger than the Republic of Armenia where you're working. But there are lots of people who live in historical Armenia who are not Armenians, mm. right? There are, uh, and Ani, you showed us Ani, is a cosmopolitan city, mm -hmm. which uh, cosmopolitanist is based on religion as well as ethnicity and, and language, quite obviously. So I just didn't, I didn't understand um, why there was this, uh, this, um, this emphasis uh, in the talk, and I look forward to perhaps modulation in the book on this this sort of eth ethnic identity uh, of these caravanserais. When, uh, after all, the Zahare, or as the Georgians called them, the Mkhartseli, yeah. excuse my Georgian pronunciation, um, you know, are a mixture of uh, Kurds, of Georgians, of Armenians, or ethnically, we don't really know exactly who they are. Uh, half of them are Orthodox, half of them are Miaphysite. And of course, um, their caravanserais are hooking in to a, the larger network that you've mentioned a couple of times, 
directly, um, you know, drawing on craftsmen who are working on, as you would, you would call it, the border, but basically there, there is no border there between Anatolia the South, the, and the South Caucasus. So, Sorry, just to interrupt you. Yeah. I'm aware that everybody's been here and is here, and the cake's given a long time. Right. I, I just have like a conversation I, like you I just have one, over a drink. So I, I just have one last point. I'm sorry I've gone on too long. I apologize. <laughs> but you mentioned two Armenian monasteries that are that you know are directly relevant to this, mm -hmm. that show the incredible cosmopolitan nature of the architecture of this time. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Samo Savank and Hovanovank are uh, just beautiful emblems of cosmopolitanists. So I'm just you know I look forward to uh, you know reading the book and talking to you over a drink about, about this sort of push and pull between the local and the cosmopolitan. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, I should say, just about my speaking your part. Oh, oh, sorry, I talked about that. Well, so what I love about it is it does explore that link between the local and the cosmopolitan. So I suggest you go away, <laughs> go away, and go to the and read the book. And it only leads me to thank Kate for a fascinating talk. Um, <laughs>